The Hisense HS218 is a 2.1 channel soundbar with 200 watts of total power. In the UK it can be found for £150, while in the US it can be found for roughly $130. In this review you can see how it compares to some of its rivals and if it's actually worth its asking price. So to kick off I do want to talk about its design and here it's got a pretty slender type of look to it, whereby it's not too tall, not too wide, nor is it too long, and in this respect should fit under most sort of TV setups whereby it's not going to obstruct any of your view. Now the soundbar itself has got a all black design and also has got a metal grille at the front protecting the forward facing drivers. No complaints whatsoever in this department. As for the subwoofer it's relatively compact and it's also connected over wirelessly and therefore you will not have a cable trailing from the main soundbar unit to the subwoofer and therefore should be a little bit of a decluttering of your overall living room setup. Now in order for you to interact with the soundbar there are some physical buttons found on the right hand side of it which is a slightly odd placement but I've got no complaints and of course if you want to control it from afar Hisense do provide a wireless remote which provides you all the right options that you need and whereby it's also comprehensively laid out. So moving swiftly on we get onto connectivity and here it has got Bluetooth support where the lowest quality SBC codec is supported only. As such you'll want to use it sparingly and if you want a heightened audio experience you'll want to plug it in. Here you have got coaxial, USB, optical and also HDMI whereby the latter port only supports the ARC standard. It's no surprise because it doesn't support Dolby Atmos or DTSX and thus does not need eARC. If your TV does have eARC arc is of course backwards compatible so you shouldn't have to have any sort of worry in order for you to have Dolby Digital reproduced by the HS218. Now with all of that out of the way let's get on to an audio demo. First off I'll be playing back a music track which is by Priya J titled Like Me and I'll be cycling through the different EQ presets so definitely do check out the annotations. Then I'll be going to a piece to camera whereby I will be presenting the Volkswagen ID5 on Totally EV. Yet again do check out for the annotations to understand how the soundbar is actually operating. trim levels, style, tech, max and also GTX, which we'll touch upon throughout this review. If you want a more detailed breakdown, do check out our written review that can be found down in the description below or indeed in the pinned comments. Now we'll also be comparing it to rival manufacturers and also other vehicles that are offered from the Volkswagen Group. So to kick off this review, we have to talk about its range and here I think it's one of the key selling points of the ID5. Now here Volkswagen include the same 81 kilowatt hour gross or 77 kilowatt hour net battery pack like you'd find on the VW ID4, the Audi Q4 e-tron and the Skoda Enyaq iV. Indeed, they share the same sort of platform, the MEB to be more specific. Now here the vehicle that we have on review is the ID5 Tech and it also has an optional 1000 pound heat pump that comes included as standard in the max trim although it will cost you an additional 1000 pounds if you go aisle or tech 
Now we would definitely suggest a heat pump no matter what sort of electric vehicle that you're getting because it really improves on efficiency. Here in our mixed driving test we actually attained a whopping 325 miles. Now let's just put that into perspective. Now I appreciate an audio demo over YouTube is never ideal, so let me get onto my subjective opinion. But before doing so, let me give you a rundown of the setup of the HS218. Now here it's got two forward-facing full-range drivers and two forward-facing 1.25 inch tweeters. It then has the wireless subwoofer which has 80 watts of total power output and the combination of the system means that you've got 200 watts of power output. Now as I mentioned, I connected it over HDMI in order for me to attain the best sort of sonic reproduction. Now you might have noticed through the audio demos that there are certain discrepancies between the different EQs. Now I should explain here over here is that if you were to enable the surround EQ it effectively disables any of the other EQs. In other words you can't use the music, movie or the news preset and also let's say your custom EQ whereby you let's say adjust the bass by a couple of notches and the treble by a couple of notches it means that it's completely redundant. In other words the surround EQ is a complete bias pass over the other presets that you have. I think this is somewhat of an oversight from the manufacturer because here if I were to run the surround mode EQ I would have wished that I could have just toned down the treble a little bit more and I'll touch upon why further down. Now with that in mind let me break it down in terms of the frequency range. First off in terms of the sub bass tones I felt that they did okay. Yes they won't compete with more premium systems out there on the market and of course here in comparison to some of its rivals such as the likes of the Creative Stage V2 2.1 it just delivers a little bit more more of that extended oomph in the low end which will certainly be appreciated when you're watching movies or let's say listening to more challenging tracks from R&B, D&B or EDM sort of music. Now as for the mid bass however it was really impressive. It was tight, it was controlled, it had loads of quantity and quality and had no complaints whatsoever in this department. Yes yet again if you're comparing it to more expensive soundbars it won't compete but for a soundbar of its price point I think it did a very good good job. Now similarly the mid-range was actually pretty surprising whereby it actually came down to the foreground whereby it wasn't pushed back all the way to the background and therefore meant that I could actually enjoy the vocals that were coming out. For example on my piece to camera when I was presenting the VW ID5 I didn't feel like my voice was overly drowned out. Equally when I was listening back to Priya J's track I didn't feel that her female vocals were taken out too much in comparison to the rest of the instruments that were portrayed through that song. However the same couldn't be quite said about the highs and by that I mean it just felt a little bit accentuated, sibilant and harsh and a bit fatiguing to my ears. While I'm not overly sensitive when it comes to my hearing range I still can hear pretty high up in terms of the frequency range and as a result meant that with the surround mode EQ which was the preferable one out of the whole bunch it meant that it was just a little bit too harsh on my ears. So in order to counteract this I went to the music EQ and then played around with the treble and bass and I found it a lot more favourable. But unfortunately here it did drown out the overall other frequencies and also meant that I wasn't getting that sort of enveloping sort of sound that you would want when you're watching back let's say a movie. Ultimately what I'm trying to say over here is that if your ears can take it the surround mode EQ enabled will give you quite accentuated highs. If however you are relatively young or you're like myself who have got quite sensitive ears and are quite precise at the top end then you might find it a little bit fatiguing to listen for longer stretches of time. Now with that in mind it perfectly leads me on to its sound stage and here for me to demonstrate what I meant with the surround EQ I'll be playing back Transformers Age of Extinction through the soundbar which is going playing via my 4k blu-ray pair and here it'll give you an indication of how much difference you are getting when you have the surround mode enabled and of course disabled. <laughs>
So hopefully you were able to pick out the difference between surround mode enabled and disabled. But just to re-emphasize the point, with surround mode enabled, I felt a lot more engaged with the content that I was consuming. But with it disabled, I felt that my ears were less fatigued in terms of longer listening sessions. But on the flip side, I had a bit more of a unidirectional sound rather than an omnidirectional sound and one that would give you some of the room filling experience. Ultimately, this really does lead me on to my verdict. And the Hisense HS218 is actually a pretty competent all-rounder. It does good across the frequency range, it's got the right sort of inputs that you want, and of course has got that wireless subwoofer, which at this price point is quite a rarity, and therefore makes it stand out in comparison to some of its competitors. If you can stand the high-end sibilance, or of course, if you don't mind a soundbar that sounds a little bit more unidirectional in comparison to some more expensive alternatives out there on the market, then the Hisense HS218 is a pretty good pick. And as a result, it gets my value award. Now I'd be intrigued to hear your thoughts of the soundbar down in the comments section below. And if you've liked this independent detail review and want to see more, definitely do drop a like, subscribe and hit that bell notification, all of which are greatly appreciated and allows me to continue delivering honest reviews like this one. As such, I've been totally dubbed and I'll hopefully see you in the next one. Take care of yourselves and goodbye.